All right, everybody. It's September 2015. We've all been hearing about this for quite a while. It's the Shemitah. The Shemitah is coming up. But what does it what does it mean? What is the Shemitah, and how does it how does it relate to us? Well, we've got we've got Neil Russell on the line tonight, and he is he is going to tell us all about that. I'm not going to put words in his mouth. Neil, how are you doing? Oh, I am doing great, thank you, guys. And uh, it is such an honor to be back on your show, Jonathan. Uh, and as you were saying, um, this is, an, this is going to be an exciting show. Uh, I, I, in fact, everybody listening, I want you to do us a favor. Send this to everybody. Because I found out most people have absolutely no clue of what is about ready to happen. So if you're tuned in tonight, send it to everybody. Now, after you hear the show, you're going to know what I'm talking about, okay? So, again, Jonathan, what a great honor it is to be here tonight. It's an honor to have you, and you were the first guest we ever had, actually, um, on this show. Show number one was Neil Russell, and here he is back. We started this at the beginning of the summer, end of the summer now. Neil Russell is just kind of a cool cool thing there. I, I like it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, again, uh, God has opened so many doors for me. Um, my book, Newton's Riddle, uh, the second edition, came out in January, as you know, and uh, just lately... Uh, God has opened major doors. Charisma Magazine, which is the largest uh, charismatic Christian magazine on earth, just did uh, two stories on Newton's Riddle. And it's due to the fact that it's God's timing. I, uh, two weeks ago, was videotaped on Prophecy in the News, which is now being aired around the world. They did two shows. And the thing is, Jonathan, I'm not sure if I share this with you, but I didn't sleep for five days. I was, uh, we, were bound, <laughs> we went to a wedding. And we were in Pennsylvania, and my wife and I couldn't sleep. Got on a plane at 4 o'clock in the morning, went out to Oklahoma City. While we were there, I didn't sleep the day of the show. <laughs> um, anyhow, bottom line is, it, you know, I trusted God. They offered me coffee before the show started, because you can hear it right now I'm very engaged. But I couldn't even talk. And I almost took the coffee, because it's been a year. It'll be a year in October since I had a cup of coffee. Uh, I am totally alkaline, and coffee has a pH of 3, which doesn't uh, go along with my diet. But I said no. I said, and when we're our weakest, God's at his strongest. So I said, Lord, just speak. And we not only did one show on Prophecy in the News, we did two shows. And both <laughs> shows are coming up. And, and a lot of the stuff that we're going to be hearing tonight, everybody, came from those shows. And as I shared with Jonathan earlier, um, there's so many people out there right now talking about Jonathan Kahn's talking about the Shemitah and uh, what I did from the morning this morning until right now right before the show is I put it all together I connected all the dots I don't think anybody's ever I, and I'm humbled that God allowed me to do this I don't think anybody's ever put together what you're gonna hear t tonight so Jonathan if we're ready I'm ready to go uh, yeah, I just want to say one one backstory. I guess the way well, Neil, you called me in the middle of that of that um, whirlwind of five days. You said you were traveling and on this side of the country, and then moving over here, doing a doing the prophecy and the news for two days or whatever. You called me in the middle of that and, and unexpectedly. I was like, oh, Neil Russell's calling. I wonder what's up with him. And you said that that, <laughs> and you you know you were kind of all over the place. But you know now I understand it. You know, but you had said that. Because you were in the middle of traveling and having sleeping, and all of a sudden now you're doing two shows and da da. da. But you had said that you had asked God. You said, "God, I'm just tired of you know. I'm kind of, tell me if I'm wrong." But what I remember is you said to me, "You asked God. You said, God, I'm tired of you know saying the same thing over and over. Can you please reveal something new to me?" And then He hits you with this, right? Right. right exactly. All right, guys, listen to this. Uh, we. I live in Maryland. I live in the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Uh, I teach at Annapolis High School. And so um, we had all these things come together at once. Uh, we had a wedding to go to in Pennsylvania. So we left here and we traveled to Pittsburgh and stayed at my mom's house. And right in front of my mom's house is a major road. And, and we were sleeping. My wife slept uh, in, in, the, in the living room. I slept on the bed part of the night. But we didn't sleep. And uh, that was for two days. But the last day I was there, Jonathan... I uh, got up early and I walked the same roads and paths that I walked as a child where I grew up. And I've been asking God, if you have anything new to share, anything that you want me to say that's different from what I've said before, 
I'm ready, God. Please let me know. And so that's when I probably called you that day. Right. Because God did download something um, into me that we're going to share tonight. So I'm ready to go. All right, Neil. I won't step in your way. I'm ready to hear this, man. Shemitah. Okay. Yeah, everybody. Uh, the title of this is called The Great September 2015 Convergence. A convergence is when, as you all know, when things converge, things come together. Uh, there's never been anything like this in the history of mankind. Uh, there are very few people out there, even though this is getting out in the news, but I'm finding out that I've ever heard of anything that you're about to hear tonight. So uh, I'm right now, I made a PowerPoint this morning because I'm preaching at a church tomorrow. And on the cover of this, and I'm going to send this to Jonathan, okay, it says the Great September 5th, uh, 2015 Convergence. And on the left side, there's a picture of the earth. There's a man blowing a shofar, and the date on there is September 13th. Now, I believe today is the 5th, so the 13th is, is what, eight, uh, do my math, so it's eight days from now. On eight days from now, guys, is Rosh Hashanah. It's a Jewish holiday. It's the Feast of Trumpets. And then, in the center of this picture, it says September the 23rd, another Jewish holiday. It's Yom Kippur. It's the Day of Atonement. And then on the far side of the picture, there's earth at the bottom. There's a blood moon. And it says September 28th, Sukkot. Sukkot is the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, these are the fall feasts that the Jewish people celebrate. They celebrate these every year. But what we're going to do is show you that this is unique. The convergence that is about ready to pl take place right before us. And by the way, Jonathan, uh, yours is the first program that this will be shared on. So here we go. All right, now, in the Bible it says, At the mouth of two or more witnesses shall matters be established. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. Now, guys, here are the witnesses that I'm going to be using tonight, and there's many, 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 many more. On September 13th, the events that are going to take place, the witness is Jonathan Kahn. Now, you mentioned Shemitah. I don't think too many people outside of Israel ever heard of that word until Jonathan Khan came up with this book about that's, two years ago called The Mystery of the Shemitah. That's where, that's, where I heard, that's where I heard of it. Yeah, and Jonathan Khan has been making his rounds, but believe it or not, not too many people have heard about him, and it blows me away. It's like, for instance, okay, now there's a guy from this area, Jonathan, that I know. He's called my house, and uh, up until recently, not too many people have even heard about him. His name is Dr. Ben Carson. He's from Baltimore. He's a pediatric neurosurgeon. He's operated on several of the students I've taught, but now everybody's hearing about him, okay? Mm -hmm. In fact, I think he's a real close second to uh, Donald Trump. Oh, right, yeah. My mom has a bumper sticker of, of him on our car, right? You know, vote Ben Carson. Yeah. So anyhow, guys, Jonathan Kahn is out there, and his date is the September 13th. We're going to talk about that. Now, the September 23rd date, is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Now, the person here lived 300 years ago, and his name is Isaac Newton, and he's the person that I wrote a book about. Okay, now, September 28th, Sukkot, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, it's the last feast of the year of the Jewish calendar, that is, is Pastor Mark Biltz. Now, Pastor Mark Biltz is a friend of mine. Uh, Pastor Mark Biltz wrote the foreword to Newton's Riddle. And he found something that is about ready to happen, which will blow you all away. So this is the great September 2015 convergence. These are our witnesses. Now, the last witness is this. It's the Word of God. And see, guys, I'm a researcher, and I don't trust people. I just don't trust people. Because we make mistakes, and I make mistakes. So as a scientist, and I teach astronomy, I do a lot of research. I've done a lot of research on what I'm going to present today. I, and it's, it's research through uh, experts, through scholars. They're a whole lot smarter than I am. People that have spent their entire life researching these. You know, you ever hear, why invent, reinvent the wheel? Well, I'm not reinventing anything. I am doing the research of people who have done this for a living and have spent their lifetime seeking this. So the Word of God is something that I established a few years ago. If I'm going to be a Christian, and I'm a Messianic Jew, then I'm going to anchor myself on one fact, that between the covers of the Bible, the Old and New Testament, is the Word of God, 
And that's what I believe. I don't believe men. I believe what that says. Now, the Bible also says, as we just talked about, you need three or more witnesses. And that's what I go by in this. So I'm going to be presenting the Word of God and three or more witnesses before all of you. And again, this again is the end of days. And the information that I'm telling you right now has not been told up until this time. So it's been bits and pieces. I told Jonathan this morning, I sat here and put this together this morning. This is for myself also. So here we go. Yeah, I, I want to jump just two seconds. Anytime. I, you're, you're the host. No, I've got, I just want to contribute to what you're saying. I called Neil and was like, hey, you know, are we still on for today? And he was like, I've been, I'm sitting here working on it right now. You know, I've been working on this presentation for the past, you know, three days or whatever. So not only am I, you know, I'm still... Yeah, I'm still preparing for it. I'm definitely getting ready for this. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, let me tell all of you. I I, t I teach school, and I told the kids, there's we, I don't teach their nose or their toes. I teach their brains. And there are just as Jonathan, you and I are different looking and so on, and our voices are different, our brains are different. And so I teach different styles. Okay, well, that's what we do. It's called di differentiated intelligence. And so, guys, I am right brain. I have to see this stuff. I'm the type of person that's really poor in math. But, but if you could show me how to do the equation and I can see it, I can do it. So I had to sit down today and do a PowerPoint because I'm, I'm, I'm preaching tomorrow in Delaware. And uh, this is what they're going to see. So I'm looking right now at this handsome man with long golden hair. And he's very familiar. He, he was born on Christmas Day, 1642, and he died on March 20th, uh, 1727. The man is Sir Isaac Newton. He's our first witness. So here we go. All right, guys, here comes a story. In the year 1656, a young schoolboy, 13 years old, skipped recess and he went to school, and what I'm looking at is that I found the actual picture of his school, and etched outside on a brick, it says Newton. Now, whether he did that or somebody else, I think he did it. But his name is sketched into the stone out there. Wow. And the name of the school is called the King School in Grantham, England. And so this is a true story, guys. This little boy, 13 years old, decided to skip recess. All right, Instead of going in the woods like I used to do, he went into the school library. And he was drawn to this one book that they had set aside. There's a lot of books in there, but this was a special book. It was the 1611 edition, King James Version of the Holy Bible. And for the first time in this young boy's life, he opened this Bible. And it just didn't turn to any old page. It opened up to a certain page, and he read a certain verse. And he opened up to Daniel chapter 12. And this is what he read. Many shall be purified, made white and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, but none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. Now, right before the headmaster rang the school bell, he questioned himself. And he said, wait a minute now. Am I the wise? And that's the first time this, in his life that he questioned something outside of science. Because as we know. Sir Isaac Newton is probably one of the smartest people that ever lived. I teach him in school. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton came up with the idea of gravity. Sir Isaac Newton came up with how, and he studied Galileo, how the planets went around the sun and everything orbits. By the way, for those of you that don't like math, like I don't like math, he came up with calculus. He oh, was the one who invented it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, he was a smart dude. But he said to himself, Am I the wise? Now, I'm going to go backwards a little bit in that same chapter. This is Daniel 12, 4. And this is what God says to Daniel, the angels talking to him. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now, a lot of people have looked at that verse and said, well, you know what? We live in a time when people are getting in cars and they're planes and they're going to and fro. And Jonathan and I are talking, Skyping, you know, we're going to and fro. And knowledge shall increase. Well, you know, that stuff's true, but that's worldly stuff. That's not what it meant here, guys. It means that at the end, people are going to be running to and fro. And knowledge about what's going to happen shall increase. Did you hear what I said? Okay, see, when Newton says, am I the wise? 
God revealed things to him that nobody else, nobody else has known for hundreds of years. But he didn't reveal everything. So right now we're going to put all this together. And here's one last verse from Daniel chapter 12. It's number, verse number three. For those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and forever. Jonathan, that's you. Right now, you have, God has given you from the beginning of time, a, a green light to produce this show. And the people out there that are listening tonight, okay, are going to hear for the first time ever information that will make them wise. Not knowledge. See, we were talking about Ben Carson a few uh, minutes ago, okay? And Ben Carson uh, was a pediatric neurosurgeon from Baltimore. And see, what he said, and I show his videos to the kid, is that, you know, everybody has knowledge. Knowledge is, you know, uh, you study in school. But what he needed to do, perform the operations, because he did brain surgery, was wisdom. Mm -hmm. He wanted to know where to cut, what not to cut. Okay, and, at that, and he said wisdom only comes from God. He was a wise person. So wise that right now he's right behind Donald Trump in the elections. And up until a few months ago, nobody outside of Baltimore knew who he was. See, guys, we are the wise. I really believe with all my heart that the reason you're listening to Jonathan's show right now is because you're seeking the truth. And you heard what it says. People are running to and fro. Now, to, much, to those who much is given, much is required. So after this show, spread the news. Tell everybody to listen to this show over and over. And take notes. Take notes from this show. So here we go. Now, Jonathan was talking about uh, uh, I was in Pennsylvania and I was asking God uh, if he had any more information to give me concerning what, I, what I'm about to say. And uh, all of a sudden, I got this, and God has never spoken audibly to me. I've never heard God's voice, but I know it's prompting. And it's when you're not thinking about something, it just pops into your head. Just thought pops into your head. And, and, and that's how I get my information. Uh, so anyhow... As I was walking through the streets where I grew up, God put this in my head, and it wouldn't let me go. Have you ever had something like that, Jonathan, that out of the blue, you get this thought, you don't know where it came from, but it just pops in your head? Yeah, and it won't go away. <laughs> and it won't go away until you act on it, right? Right. Okay, well, that's what happened. So I got home, and it was early in the morning. My, my wife got up and I said, uh, Marianne, I don't know why. But I need to find out why the number seven is so important in the Bible. Now, I've, I know the, the numbers of seven are, are in the verses I'm going to be reading, but I wanted to know what made it so important, okay? So here it comes. The number seven is the key. It's that key that unlocks the sealed mysteries that are in Daniel and throughout the Bible. It is the key. Now, I recently did a Google search. On the number seven in the Bible, and this is what I found out. These are truly amazing facts. There are over 860 references to the number seven in both the Old and New Testament. The number seven is considered the foundation of God's word. The number seven represents holiness, perfection, completion, and restoration. The number seven is the number of God's supernatural realm and his eternal kingdom. One can only enter God's kingdom by faith, by repenting of one's sin, and by trusting in Yeshua alone. Now, Yeshua, I'm, I'm Jewish, means Jesus. That's his, that was his name when he was on the streets back in Jerusalem 2,000 years. Hey, Yeshua, what's going on, man? Okay, that was his name, Yeshua. And, and, and the Greek word is, is Jesus, but his name is Yeshua. Okay, now, Yeshua, the sacrificial lamb, as their Lord and Savior of their lives. Now, here's the big thing. Do you trust God? Do you trust? Because if you do, then this number seven, we're going to find out how important it is in the Bible right now because it unlocks everything, is where you live. Now, there's another number, okay, that's just as prevalent in the Bible, and it's one less than seven. It's the number six. The number six is the number of the natural realm that we all live in. It's the earthly kingdom, and it's ruled by Satan. God created the universe, the earth, and all living things, including us, in six days, in six 24-hour days. 
but the seventh day he rested. The sixth is the number of man. The six represents the worldly conditions that are both unholy, imperfect, they're temporal, and they're also chaotic. It starts from a state of order and it ends in a state of disorder. Now, guys, I want to stop right there, okay? We all studied history. We studied civilizations. We studied biology. We study all these things in school. Now, I want to tell you something, guys. Uh, I'm a science teacher. And I wish I could go on TV. I always say with Bill Nye, the science guy, because I really like him. Like, I, I could blow him out of the water. These people that go on there that are not science teachers, they don't have the, they're not equipped to go after somebody who understands science. At least he thinks he does, all right? See, everything was created from a state of order. God made everything perfect. He said it was good. But from that time until now, and take a look at everything around you, the things that start in order end in disorder. I'm living in a body right now that started out as a little baby, okay? And here I am going to be 63 in a month. And boy, is it taking a lot of effort to keeping this body in order, guys. I had cancer this past year. Uh, I changed my diet. I went with godly wisdom, and I'm doing everything I can to la make this body last until Jesus comes back in hell. I went to a landfill not too long ago, and uh, I was watching people backing up with their pickup trucks, throwing all this stuff down in the hole that was brand new at one time, that they paid a fortune for, that they worked their butts off for, and now it's all trash. See, that's the world. It starts from a state of order and ends in disorder. There is no such thing as evolution that we came from one uh, species, to, uh, not, not species, from one animal to another. Within a species, we do have evolution. When Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands, he saw the finches. Okay, some had curved beaks, some had pointy beaks. The curved beaks, you know, because there wasn't enough food, they cracked the nuts. The pointy beaks got the bugs out of the trees. But guess what, guys? They were all finches. They didn't change into a, a, a duck or anything else. The iguanas on the island, there wasn't anything to eat. They ate the moss. They swam. They were still iguanas. It's a different species. That's all he found out. It's called microevolution. There has never been proof that one animal has changed into another animal. Never, ever, ever, ever. In fact, I want to tell you real quick. A few years ago, because I studied paleontology in China, they came up with these dinosaur fossils that had feathers. Okay, So in Jurassic Park, Jonathan, you may have seen the, from the first one to the last one, the velociraptors starting to eat feathers on them. Right. You won't see dinosaurs with feathers anymore because they forged it. They forged it in China so they would make a lot of money on that fossil. That's all they did. Really? Okay? So, oh, yeah. And, and they, took the, they took the feathers off the dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> they took them off? They went they back did, and took it Wow. Yeah. But see, that, that, that again, that's the world, okay? Right. Now, last, the sixes. The 666, we've all heard of that, is the mark of the beast. It is the world system imposed by Satan on planet Earth during the final seven years before Jesus' return. So the six, okay, now here's the, here's the point that I just made. I hope it's now in your minds, and it's in my mind, that it is paramount to our understanding of unlocking the sealed mysteries of the Bible. You either live in realm seven or realm six. It's either in God we trust, as our money says, or in man we trust. There are no in-betweens. Either God is first in our lives, or we are first in our lives. And that's the bottom line. See, guys, when my wife Cindy died, and I almost gave up on God, but I didn't, thank God, okay? And I met a beautiful woman across the road who was a, a widow, and we got married, and uh, God's restored everything that the devil's taken away from me. But again, Guys, I chose. I chose to stick with God, and God restored everything. We, as Christians, live our lives in God's kingdom. We totally trust him to supply all of our needs. I don't worry anymore. See, God's first, Jonathan. In my life, God's first, and others are second. Those children of my class, from the beginning of time, because it tells you that the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. I'm only righteous by the blood of Christ. I repent every day. So those kids are mine. That's my responsibility. And so what I'm even saying tonight, all this, I'm not getting paid. I give all my money away. I give every penny away from my books. My mother calls me a Meshuggah, crazy Jew. But, <laughs> I, but my money comes from, I'm a school teacher, and that's where my money comes from. But the book makes a lot of money. I give it all away. I give it to uh, wherever God tells me to give it to, okay? Right. So, again, he supplies all my needs. I don't worry about anything. Okay, when I had, had cancer. And it was, it was a, an aggressive prostate cancer. And uh, I just prayed 
uh, God's verse, okay, by Jesus' stripes I'm healed. And I, I had peace about that. And uh, I just went to the doctors the other day. My PSA, which was 21, which is like off the chart, is zero, 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 zero. Okay? Wow. See? And that's, you know, again, during the time you could worry and say, oh, my gosh, you know, I got aggressive prostate cancer. People die. No, I didn't. God's word says that you're not to worry. You have peace. So anyhow, I live in I live in Kingdom 7, okay? I, I used to live in the 6. I used to live in the world. Now listen to what Jesus said. This is what Jesus tells us. This is important. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Guys, the number 7 unlocks it. It's the gospel of the kingdom, okay? And we're going to unlock all these mysteries tonight using that number. All right, now that the prophetic importance of the number seven is firmly established, let's apply it to not only Isaac Newton's end-time calculations, guys, but also to the end-time calculations made by Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, the author of the mystery of the Shemitah. Now, uh, it, for those of you who never heard Shemitah before, I'm going to give you the meaning of it. It means release, release, okay? Shemitah means release. It is the seventh year of a seven-year agricultural cycle mandated by God in the Torah. During the Shemitah, the seventh year, the land is left to lie uncultivated. And all agricultural activity, including plowing and planting and pruning and harvesting, was forbidden. Now, in chapter 5 of the book of Leviticus, promises bountiful harvest to those who observe the Shemitah. Now, I want to say that again. For six years, you're allowed to plant. You're allowed to harvest. You're allowed to sell. But this is what God told them. And this is in, again, this is in the Bible. This is in the Torah. It's in Leviticus. And Moses, the one who said, he came down from uh, the mountain, and he told them, this is what God told me. Now, I'm going to read you what God said to Moses, all right? So, again, this is not Neil talking. This is God. In Leviticus 25, 1 through 7, And the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, say it to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your, heart, uh, your vineyards and gather your fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath. Remember, Sabbath means rest, okay? A rest, a solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. Now remember, if we're living in the sevens, we trust God. We don't trust man, we trust God. You shall ne neither sow your field nor prune your vineyards, and the Sabbath shall produce the, in the land all the food that you need without even planting. For you, your males and female servants, your hired hands, the stranger who dwells with you, for your livestock, for all the beasts that are in your land, all its produce shall be your food. All God said, trust me on that seventh year. Plant the sixth, trust me on the seventh. The seventh, again, is the release. God will release it to you, okay? Now, this is something really cool. The seventh year. Okay, if you did it, okay, every seven sevens, you count off every seven sevens. Seven times seven is 49 years. So if you do that for 49 years, this is what happens. So that on the seventh Sabbath year, the amount of period of time would be 49 years. Then, having the trumpet sounded everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the Day of Atonement, the sound of the trumpet throughout the land, consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee to all of you. Each of you is to return to your family's property and your own claim. The fiftieth year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow and do not reap that whatever grows or harvest the unattended vines. For it is a jubilee, and it will be holy to, for you. Eat only which is taken directly from the fields, and I will send you such a blessing on the sixth year that the land will yield enough for three more years. While you plant during the eighth year, you will eat from the old crop, and it will continue to eat from it until the harvest of the ninth year comes. Now, jubilee. Jubilee happens every seven Sabbaths, seven times seven. 49 years, and the 50th year is a jubilee. Now, this is important to what's going to be coming up, okay? So I want you all to get it, all right? Yeah. Now, all right. Now, here's what Sir Isaac Newton says, okay? And I got a picture of that handsome dude. 
<laughs> it says, the seven sevens are the compass of a jubilee and begin and end with actions proper for a jubilee and the highest nature for all which a jubilee can be kept. See, Isaac Newton was a Bible scholar. He learned all the ancient language so he could understand the real language of the Bible. Not translated, but what it actually said in Hebrew. Okay? Now, I'm going to go on to the next chapter, everybody. This is Leviticus 26, verses 14 through 16. But if you will not listen to me and carry out all these commands, and if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and fail to carry out my commands and so violate my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will multiply your affliction seven times over as your sins deserve. All right, now here we go. All right, everybody. By the end of the 6th century B.C., now, this is not taught in churches. This is not taught anywhere. Okay, what you're about to hear, I didn't even know this. All right, so I was questioning. All right, how many years was it from the time Moses got that from God until uh, the book of Daniel? How long? Because in the book of Daniel, that's where we're headed next. They were all carried, the, all the Jews were carried out to captivity of Babylon. So here it comes. By the end of the 6th century B.C., Israel had failed to observe a total of 70 Sabbath Shemitah years. All of them, guys, he didn't do it. They didn't trust God. They didn't trust God. They did not live in the sevens. They didn't live in the kingdom for 490 years. In judgment against Israel's pervasive and persistent sin, God used the Babylonian Empire to execute judgment upon the southern kingdom of Judah beginning in the year 606 B.C., just as he's used the Assyrians over the century earlier against the northern kingdom of Israel. In addition to ultimately leveling Jerusalem and destroying the temple, the Babylonians carried away large numbers of Israelites into captivity, a captivity that lasted 70 years. One year for each Sabbath year, each Shemitah, that the nation failed to observe the Shemitah. Thus, because of this, God imposed Shemitah with the Israelites being in captivity in Babylon. The promised land rested for the same number of years that the Israelites failed to allow the land to rest as the Lord had commanded. And that's also in Second Chronicles 36, verses 20 through 21 that I just read. What do you think about that, Jonathan? It, it, sounds, it sounds fair. It sounds... Uh, um... I don't, for what I think about it, does that apply to us? Should we be doing this? That's the first thing. Is like I, I was okay. worried. I was worried that we're, that we're, you know, wait a minute. Are we as Christians supposed to be doing that? Because I have okay. not. All right. No, 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 no. Here's the thing as Christians, okay? This was given to the Jews. This was given to the Israel. These are the laws to Israel living in the land. Okay, that, in fact, all this, everybody's hearing from, this is going to happen to America, and that's going to happen to Mary. Let's stop right now and say we're going to focus on Israel. Now, do we trust God and his word? And the answer is God says he will bless us who, who does that. Okay, If we trust God's word, we will be blessed. Yes, absolutely. But what I'm telling you, this is what happened. To, it was his covenant with the Israelites, and it was told to them through Moses, okay, this is what we want. God wants you to do, and if you do it, you trust him, you're going to be blessed, and if you don't, and they didn't listen. And it's just not Israel, it's the rest of the world today. We're right. turning against God like never before, okay? So again, the numbers add up to 490 years, and here we go. Now, I'm going to take us to a little captive boy who was taken captive at the age of 14 by the Babylonians and taken into Babylon, and his name was Daniel. And Daniel lived to be a ripe old age of 84 years old. So one day, Daniel is praying to God, which he would do every day. He'd go three times to his window, which faced Jerusalem. And this is the beginning of chapter 9. So guys, I can paraphrase this, but I don't think I, God wants me to paraphrase this for you tonight. I'm going to read it from the New King James Version, if that's okay. So this is Daniel. He's 84 years old. And this is in the first year of Darius the Mede, who was the ruler over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. This is the Babylonians. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the books, according to the word of God, to Jeremiah the prophet, that the number of years for the desolation of Jerusalem would be 70. So here he did the math, 
He's 80 years, 84 years old. He was 14 when he was taken captive. Well, 70 years is up. And he went before God. And he said right here, So I turned my attention to the Lord to seek him by prayer and petitions with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but this day public shame belongs to us, the men of Judah, the residents of Jerusalem and all of Israel, those who are near and those who are far, in all the countries where you have dispersed them because of the disloyalty they have shown toward you. Lord, public shame belongs to us, our kings, our leaders, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. Compassion and forgiveness belongs to the Lord our God, that we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by following his instructions that he has set before us through his servant, the prophets. Now this is, again, I'm reading this. This is Daniel chapter 9, verse 11 through 14. All Israel has broken your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. The promised curse written in the laws of Moses, a servant of God, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have carried us out. He has carried out his word. He's talking about God that he spoke against us and against our rulers by bringing us so great a disaster that nothing like this has ever been done to Jerusalem and has ever been done under heaven. Just as is written in the law of Moses, all the disasters have come upon us, yet we have not appeased the Lord our God by turning from our iniquities and paying attention to your truth. So the Lord kept the disaster in mind and brought it to us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all that he has done, but, he is, but we have disobeyed him. Now, this is verses 15 to 16. Now, Lord, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made your name renowned, and in this day, we have sinned. We have acted wickedly. Lord, in keeping in all your righteous ways, your anger and your wrath, turn away from your city, Jerusalem, from your holy mountain. For because our sins and iniquities and our fathers in Jerusalem and your people have become an object of ridicule to all those around us. Therefore, our God, hear the prayer and petition of your servant. Show your favor to the desolate sanctuary of the Lord for your sake, Lord. Listen, my God, and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation in the city called by your name. For we are not presenting our petition before you based upon our righteous acts, but based upon your abundant compassion. Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen and act. My God, your, for your sake, do not delay because your city and your people are called by your name. I'm going to stop right there. Okay, now everybody listen. I'm not sure if anybody here has ever read that before. But this was told by a man who was in captivity. He's been away from his homeland. The Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and the temple because of their sin. God sent warning after warning and prophet after prophet. They didn't keep the Shemitah. They didn't keep the Ten Commandments. They sinned against God. This is exactly what's happening today in this world. America is doing the same thing. We were founded on godly principles, guys, and we turned away from God. And guess what? Judgment's on its way. Yes, we don't have to keep the Shemitah here, but God works by the Shemitah. So we're going to get started. Let's go back to the next verse. This is chapter 9, verses 20 through 23. Now this is Daniel. While I was speaking, praying, confessing my sin and the sins of the people of Israel, and presenting my petition before Yahweh, my God, concerning the holy mountain of God, and while I was praying, Gabriel the man I had seen in my first vision came to me in extreme weariness after the time and the evening offering. He gave me this explanation. Now I want you to hear this, guys, because it's explained later on in the book of Daniel that Gabriel had to fight all of these demon princes to get to Daniel. See, guys, the devil is the ruler of this world. And if you read Newton's Riddle, which I highly recommend you read because it is the only book out there that explains the devil's plans to destroy you and this country and Israel and to keep himself from going into the lake of fire. It is done on two levels. It's done on what's happening now, and it's done on a supernatural level. And so Gabriel came, and this is what he says to Daniel. Daniel, I've come now to give you an, your understanding. At the beginning of your petitions, an answer went out, and I have come to give it to you. For you are treasured by God. So consider the message and understand the vision. Okay? 
Here it comes. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks, 490 more years are decreed for your people and your holy city, Jerusalem, to bring the rebellion to the end, to put a stop to sin, to wipe away iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. I'm going to stop right there, and I'm going to tell you all something. Israel today is in the land. My countrymen are back there. But very, very, very few are honoring God. Very, very few are keeping the commandments. Very, very few Jews in America are doing the same thing. As Christians also, that people that call themselves Christians. We're not. We're going to the number six instead of the number seven. We're trusting man and we're sitting instead of trusting God. And so 490 years, God said, would be more punishment, okay? And at the end of that 490 years, that's what's going to happen, okay? Rebellion will end. Sin will end. God will wipe away iniquity. He'll bring everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision of prophecy, and anoint the most holy. This is to the Jews. This is not talking about Western Christianity. This is talking about the Jews. So here we go. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, the week is a prophetic week. It's seven years. So when you hear seven weeks, it's seven year, weeks times seven. And when you hear 62 weeks, it's 62 weeks or, or years times seven. The streets shall, shall be built again and the walls of the, of the city, even in troublesome times. Daniel 9, chapter 9, verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, that's 62 years times seven, Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end shall be like a flood until the end of the war of desolations are determined. All right, I'm stopping right there. Here comes the seventh key. This is a key to unlock the sealed prophecies. The first restoration to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem came on March 5th, 444 B.C. by King Artaxerxes of Persia. Okay, described in the book of Nehemiah. Artaxerxes did this in response to a request by his Jewish cupbearer, Nehemiah. Then exactly 69 sevens, okay, of prophetic years later. Now, let's do the math. 69 years times seven. And a Jewish year is not 360 days. It's 300, I'm sorry, 365 days is our calendar. They have a different calendar. Their calendar is based on 360 days. So 69 years times 7 times 360 days comes up to a grand total of 173,880 days. Now, if you take that number and you add that on to the beginning, which is March 5th, this is when the order was given out to rebuild the walls, 444 B.C., the Messiah arrives in Jerusalem riding on a donkey on March 30th, 33 A.D., three days before Jesus was crucified. It takes you right to that day. And he goes through a gate, the same gate that St. Stephen was taken through. It's called the Lion's Gate, which is still there today, guys. That was the first restoration command. Here comes another key using the number seven to unlock the mysteries. Here they come. Now, this has never been told outside of me telling this on um, uh, Prophecy in the News last week. I did a lot of research on this. My wife and I were in Israel a few years back, and I actually saw this for myself. The second restoration command, Jonathan, was given in 1538 A.D., by Suleiman the Magnificent, who ruled the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire had controlled Jerusalem since 1517. Suleiman relates that during a dream, he was told to build the wall around Jerusalem. So he taxed all the people. The wall that Suleiman built is a wall that surrounds the old city today. Now, when you go to Jerusalem and you look at the pictures of it, the rocks that you see that make up the wall were put there not by King Herod, they were destroyed in 70 A.D. Every rock was pushed down. 
When you go to the uh, the Wailing Wall, that area was underground. They excavated. There's only like two layers of, of King Solomon's and Herod's rock. The rest of them are piled up haphazardly by Suleiman. Okay? The order, now this is huge, guys. I want you to hear that. The order to build the walls, okay, by Suleiman was given in 1538 AD. That's when they started. Suleiman also built several gates, including the Lion's Gate. And there is evidence that the Lion's Gate was completed on August 21st, 1539. Now, if you take those 69 sevens again, okay, let's multiply them together. 69 times 7 times the 360, you come out again with 173,880 days, which brings us, which brings us exactly to September 23rd, 2015. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement which is just two weeks from now, just two weeks from now. Remember it said in, in verse 25, chapter 9, that even the walls will be restored in perilous times. The walls are restored. This is the second restoration of the walls, Jonathan. Now I'm going to stop. I've been talking a lot. What do you think about all this? <clears throat> it, it makes sense. Um, uh, it's... it's, it's uh, I don't. I don't know what to say about it. Okay. Well, it, it I'll tell you totally. What, uh, it totally makes sense. Uh, Seventy weeks, you know, and you, you know, you did it by years and days and stuff. It comes out to now, and basically, what it was saying is, we have seventy weeks to do all the evil we want to, and then after that, we're going to be purified. Or did I get that wrong? Okay. Well, when you're saying we, let's go back in time. This is what it says in the Old Testament. God gave them these rules, and then remember the sevens, the seven times seven. These all add up. Now, I'm going to give you another key. Here comes another key, another seven. You all ready, everybody? Another seven to unlock. Big one. This is what I wrote about, Sir Isaac Newton. Now, Sir Isaac Newton says that the 62 sevens, okay, the weeks of years, or the, the first 434 years was fulfilled with the first coming. And he was right. I just told you that. I gave you all the information that it takes us right to Jesus' first coming. But Isaac Newton looked at this differently. He said the 49 years, okay, that's mentioned in the seven sevens, will apply to the second coming. Amazingly, everybody, three centuries ago, Newton also saw in the scriptures and wrote that the rebirth of Israel would come at a time that Israel wasn't even thought of. It was preposterous back then in the 17th century. According to Newton's calculations, the adding of Daniel's 77s, or the 49 years, would begin the moment when Jerusalem was reestablished once again as the capital of, of Israel. Now, if you multiply the seven sevens, the 49 Jewish years, from the day Israel recaptured the Temple Mount on June 7, 1967, that was after the Six-Day War, okay? So that, that happened in my lifetime. And you multiply that times that 360. You take 49 times 360. Here comes another number. 17,640 days. Now, if you take those days and you start from June 7th, where Newton said that would, that's a start, you come up with, again, amazingly, everybody, September 23rd, 2015. Again, in two weeks from now, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Now, Jonathan, I'm not sure if you know this, but on that day, okay, September 23rd, 2015, do you know who's going to be visiting the White House and Barack Obama? Is it the Pope? The Pope! <laughs> the Pope! Now, of all the days to come here to America to visit the president, it's going to be on that day. These numbers crunch out. These are thousand-year-old numbers. Remember, the number seven is God's number, okay? It is the key to unlock all of these mysteries. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. I've always heard that seven is God's number. Is that common knowledge, I guess? Well, we've heard that, but it's not, not application. So right. what I'm using right. now is the application. It's the key to unlock all these sealed verses, okay? Right, yeah, how you're using it is the, is the yeah, seven is God's number. You know, what do you do with that? Well, you have yeah. the key. You have, you understand God has shown you how to use it, and that's that's fascinating. I'm, well, I'm I, really interested in this. Yeah, well, Jonathan, again, it wasn't until two weeks ago that I'm walking around, and I'm saying, I, again, God said, Neil, I want you to talk about this. No, that didn't happen. This popped into my mind out of the blue. I mean, I could talk about this without even adding the seven as the key. 
but it unlocks it. Mm -hmm. The seven is God's perfection. The number seven is God's number, guys. It's where we should be living and trusting God. God told the Jews, okay, this, this is, again, I'm going to reiterate, I'm a teacher. Trust me, trust me, on the seventh year, don't plan anything. In the seventh year, there'll be such a bounty, all you got to do is go out there and pick it for the whole year, guys. Now, on the Jubilee, the 77s, you're to forgive everybody that held anything against you. Return everything to everybody. That's what a Jubilee is. Go back to scratch. And I, if you do that, I'll bless you for three more years. You'll have plenty. They didn't do it. They didn't do it for a period, as I said, of the 77s, okay, for 490 years. Oh, my gosh. So the judgment now, and I read you in Daniel, is for 490 more years until, and by the way, guys, it's almost up. The 490 years, everybody, now, Jonathan, put your seatbelt on, okay. ends, ends, Jonathan, in two weeks. In two weeks, Jonathan. It ends in two weeks. I mean, I can't even believe I'm saying that. I never thought these thoughts before, Jonathan. It ends in two weeks. It's staggering. Well, it's Yeah, that's, that's the thing, guys. It ends in two weeks. Now, all right, the first witness is over. I just presented Newton to you. So I'm going to go on to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. We're going to go now to two weeks from now. So here it comes. The next two witnesses come in play. This is Jonathan Kahn and Mark Biltz. So I'm going to read you 9.27. By the way, guys, I've read 9.27 for years and years. I really never understood it until this moment. It makes sense. Yeah, that's then, that's what yeah. I find really fascinating. You know, like like you said, God just kind of unlocked it to you. You know, you read this verse all the time, but God made it make sense finally to you. Well, so I hope it's making sense to everybody. Now, again, you're going to have to play, guys, you're going to have to play this over and over and over again because, again, uh, Jonathan's been obedient to produce this show. This is the first time anybody's put all the dots together, okay? Now, here it comes. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now, a lot of people stopping right there. One week is seven years. Now, let's take a look at it. So between Daniel 9.25 and 9.27, we got the 62 weeks, okay? We've got the 7.7 seven weeks, and now we got the last week, which is seven years. So if you add all these numbers up again, 62 times 7 plus 7 times 7 plus 7, you come up with 490 years, okay? So this is the last of those 7. This hasn't happened yet. This is the last of the 7. This hasn't happened yet, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. It's about ready to happen. And he shall confirm a covenant with many. Now, who's the he? I'm going to read on. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. And the wing of, de uh, of the abominations shall be the one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Now, that's a bunch of, of words there. All right, I'm going to break that down. This is a, what a lot of people understand. Antichrist shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Here's what I think is going to happen. And in fact, I'm absolutely sure. I can't tell you when, but I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. Guys, You've been following the news. You've heard all the terms ISIS and uh, Iran and treaty and all this stuff that's been going on. We're on the verge of a big, giant war in the Middle East. In Newton's riddle, the war was the Psalm 83 war. If you open up to uh, Psalm 83, it tells you that Israel's ready to be annihilated by all the countries around, and they cry out to God. Okay, And God does save them. God has always saved them. But this is a monster war. This is the next thing that's going to happen. Now, everybody said, well, what's going to happen? And I said, I don't know. i got a bunch of friends that think their bags are packed. They think they're going to get raptured in a couple of weeks. Uh, maybe they are. I can't tell you that. I'm not, and I'm not going to say that because God didn't tell me anything. Okay? I'm just telling you what people are thinking. All right? So, yes, I truly believe there's going to be a, a monster Middle Eastern war. I mean, everybody out there, not Christian on Christian, say, ah, oh, it's coming. The other thing, guys, the stock market has dropped. A lot, right, Jonathan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> in fact, I think it's dropped more in the past couple of weeks than it's dropped ever. I mean, really, the numbers, I mean, it was way up there, but it dropped on Friday again, okay? It's been like a roller coaster, but I think it's dropped like almost 2,500 points since it's, uh, it's high. And that's unheard of, but that's not the end of it. Watch what happens. We're, and everybody's saying, and a lot of people are talking out there, you know, and, and my wife, 
she has some money and she doesn't know what to do with it. And somebody came over to my house tonight and said, well, what do I do with my money? I said, just wait, just <laughs> wait, everybody, just wait. I wouldn't put in the stock market at the present moment. I would just wait, okay? So I truly believe there's a possibility that we're going to have a giant change in our monetary system, okay? I read today, just today, Jonathan, that there's going to be a big meeting October 1st of all these major players. The United States was not included in this. And see, our money is, is based upon what's called the petrodollar, okay? It's based upon petroleum, the dollar. That's, there's going to be a change. I've been waiting for this, and it looks like it's going to happen. And when this happens on top of a war, we're in for a monster change, guys, okay? You have to be, again, in Realm 7, okay? You can't be in Realm 6. There's going to be a lot of people in Realm 6 that thought they were in 7, but they're not. They're going to go back to 6. We'll we might talk about that another show, but not this one. All right? Yeah. So in the middle of the week, three and a half years, the Antichrist will end. There's going to be a temple rebuilt in Jerusalem during that time, and he will end that sacrifice. Guys, I was in Jerusalem. I saw it. All the increments for the new temple are already there. They just have to build it. And when that covenant is signed, and this ends Newton's riddle, the end of the book, the temple is rebuilt. It's going to happen, okay? And the Antichrist will be the leader of the world. We're going to have a new currency coming up. It's all going to happen during that last week. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened, but it's on its way. Okay, here we go. Witness number two, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, the author of The Harbinger and Mystery of the Shemitah. Okay, now listen. This is the next key to unlock the sevens. All right, here we go. All right, the Shemitah Jubilee year, the prophetic signs. Now, Jonathan Kahn did some research, and it was only a few years back, and he discovered that the Shemitah that was supposed to happen in Israel is actually happening worldwide, Jonathan. Really? It, really. He did some research. Now, remember, it's a seven-year period that on the seventh year, you let your crops rest, okay? And then you have a jubilee, and the jubilee is for one year, and God will bless you. Well, he went backward in time, and I have a chart right in front of me. It goes all the way back, and it counts all the Shemitahs. But the jubilees I'm looking at is the, 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 the first jubilee that goes, that's recent. I wasn't born, you weren't born, but it was in 17, 1917, 1918. And this was the Belford Agreement. This was in Britain. And the Belfort Agreement, and Great Britain was in charge of the, of the Middle East at that time in Palestine. They showed favor. Belfort was a Christian. He showed favor over Israel. And that was the birth of Israel. He said, now is the time for the Jews, because he read the Bible, to come back to the land. It also ended World War I that year. And there was also a stock market crash that year. Now, I'm looking at all the stock market crashes that happened during all these Shemitah years. It goes 1917, 1924, 1931, 1938. Okay, these are all, and then again, stock market crashes, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take us up to 1967, and this is the year, this was a Jubilee year, okay? This was after seven Shemitahs, seven sevens. This is what happened in Israel. The next 49 years, the Jews regained Jerusalem. They regained Jerusalem. God blessed them. So the first jubilee that I mentioned in 17, 1917, 1918, they, the Belford Agreement gave permission for the Jews to return to their land. Now in 67, all the countries attacked Israel. Israel got back their capital after 2,000 years. Again, they got back their capital. Now, there's a bunch of more Shemitahs that go by, 49 years. And I'll just read the, the years of the Shemitah. That, these are the ones we lived through, guys. So here we go. In 1973, uh, I'm not sure if you were alive back there, Jonathan, but I was. We had an oil shock. The price of oil went cuckoo that year. Right. We had gas lines. I was in college. Okay, I was traveling from... Uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland, the gas lines happened that year. In 1980, the next seven years, we had a hard recession. In 1987, we had another stock market crash. In 1994, there was a bond market crash. In the year 2001, there was a market crash again, and it was 9-11. On the same date, the World Trade Center was uh, hit by the airplanes, okay? Right. 
All right, now, in 2008, and you lived through that. I think you're old enough to say that. We had another <laughs> stock market crash. Yeah. Right, here we are at the end of the Shemitah year, okay, seven years later, and that's where we are right now. Okay, the next Jubilee starts, okay, after the 67. It starts this coming. It starts, guys, the next Jubilee starts on Yom Kippur just two weeks from now. Now, on the 29th of Elul, Elul, guys, this is the Jewish calendar, the last day before the Feast of Trumpets, all debt, this is a, again, this is what's supposed to happen. All debts are to be settled in the Shemitah year. Okay, when this happened, came the two biggest stock market crashes in 2001 and 2008. A major sign to watch for the next 29th of Elul, guys, is September 13th, 2015. Now, what I just summarized for you real quick is what Jonathan Kahn is going around the world and telling everybody. I just summarized what Jonathan Kahn just said. Mm -hmm. All right? This is what he found out. Okay, so let's get it one more time. I'm going to do this. Remember what Leviticus 25 told us, that we'd be blessed. These are the Shemitah signs of the seven-year cycle. Let's just take a look at the last seven years, starting with 66. Okay, we had a 20% drop in the stock market. 73, we had the oil shock. By the way, that was a year of Roe versus Wade in 73, when we passed legalized abortion. And we just found out what they're doing with babies, okay? It's worse than the Holocaust, people. Worse than the Holocaust to sell baby parts. In 1980, we had a hard recession began. I'm not sure if you remember, Jonathan, but um, I remember interest rates like 20% back then. It was crazy. Wow. Okay, 1987, the stock market crashed. Uh, by the way, guys, this is all during the month of September, guys. All during a little 29, guys. 94, bond market crashed. 2001, stock market crashed in September. Then we had again 9-11. 2008, stock market crashed to the day, to the hour. Okay, I'm not Jonathan Kahn, I'm just Neil Russell, but it really happened. Okay, now, 2015, Elul 29, September 13, two, uh, eight days away, guys. Stock market has already dropped <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Okay, our debt, we're, right now, our debt is over $18 trillion. Yeah. We can't afford to have another crash, Jonathan. Yeah, and people are talking about. You know, no one, no one wants to invest in the dollar anymore because everyone knows it's about to collapse. Right. Well, anyhow, I'm, now I'm going to fine-tune it. Let me fine-tune it, guys. Let's go back just a few years ago, okay? September 17, 2001, on the 29th of Elul, stock market dropped 685 points, the second biggest loss of the stock market. Seven years later, September 29, 2008, the 29th of Elul, okay, again, 770 point loss, the biggest stock market loss ever. Seven years later, September 13th, just eight days away, we already lost 2,200 points, Jonathan. That's worse than that. That's that's more than those two added up. Oh my gosh! Now, what I'm telling you guys again, if you go against God's laws, and we we went over the laws earlier, you read them Leviticus 26. This is what happens. We were founded on godly principles. We are God's people. But God's people has turned against God. We're living in six instead of seven. God wants us to trust him, put him first, put him first, love people, not judge people, but love people, okay? That's up to God to judge. And we're to forgive everybody. Jonathan, do you know that the number one tool of the devil is unforgiveness? I believe it. Every day somebody's going to make us upset. And somebody's going to just, that, that, that they're going to turn our wheels and, Here's what happens. I'm going to tell you guys a story. I told my wife that today. My mother had a friend, an elderly friend, and she read her Bible every single day. And I wrote music, and she loved playing one of my songs over and over again. But she had one thing the devil got her on. Her daughter-in-law did something really bad to her, and she couldn't forgive her. And I kept on telling her, and I can't remember her name. I said, you got to forgive her. It says in the Bible, God tells you. It's in the book of Mark. Unless you forgive others, God can't forgive us. That's in the Bible. And see, that's a tool of the devil. And to my knowledge, Jonathan, I don't think she, I think she went to her Beth dead, Beth, <laughs> deathbed, yeah, I'm getting old and <laughs> tired, uh, with unforgiveness. And that separates us from God. Okay? It separates us from God, guys. Man. we got to forgive everybody, no matter what. I'm a school teacher. i got kids that cuss me out and everything else. 
And I tell them, hey, my name is Russ, and if you cuss, then I will fuss, but I still love you. <laughs> <laughs> you bust a rhyme on them. I, I, oh, man, I can rhyme. <laughs> my brain works overtime. All right, let me. right, I'm almost done, guys. Oh, so no. again, so again, listen, seven times seven is 49 years, okay? That's the Shemitah. That's the, se- the 70th year is now. We're at the end of this. A jubilee is right in front of us. Now, the last witness. This is it. Mark Biltz, my buddy Mark. Mark, if you're listening out there, here we come, okay? Mark Biltz is a pastor of a church, a big church in Tacoma, Washington. Now, I'm going to tell you guys a story. When my book first came out in 2008, um, and it was a number one bestseller on Amazon because I was on Sid Roth. And uh, I got a phone call from this guy named Mark Biltz, a pastor out there in Tacoma, Washington. He said uh, he would like to sell my book at his uh, church. And I said, sure, go for it. He said, by the way, I just wrote a book. And I said, well, what's your book about? He said, well, I went on this NASA website and discovered that every so often we have these what's called tetrads, which for lunar blood, blood moon eclipses. Now, these are lunar eclipses. The lunar eclipse, and I teach astronomy, is when the sun, the earth, and the moon are in a perfect straight line. And the shadow of the earth is cast on the moon, and the moon appears during that time when it's in the shadow to be a reddish color, okay? But he found out that this tetrad has happened on these Jewish events, on these Jewish holidays. When Israel became a nation, they had blood red moons. In 67, we had blood moons, okay? And it happens on these tetrads. Now, he dis- went into the future. Again, this is in 2008. And he said, well, the next tetrad's coming up in the year 2014-15. I said, really? Now, that was in the future when he told me that. And I said, uh, I said, I just got off television. I know Sid Roth. You want to get on his show? So I called and contacted Sid Roth and got him on the show. Now, he'd already been on Prophecy in the News. but his. Now, I want you to hear this, everybody. This is not what they're talking about in the book of Joel, that Mm. the sun will turn black and the moon will turn blood red. That takes place during the book, during the last seven years. I believe that takes place on Revelation chapter six at the end when the wrath of God hits the earth. That's what it says. These are omens An omen are warnings. Everything I've told you guys so far are warnings. These are warnings. They're major warnings. Okay, so. The first of the tetrads happened on April 15, 2014. That was the, on Passover. The second tetrad of the, uh, the blood moons happened on Sukkoth last year, on October 9th. Now, in between, we had a total solar eclipse on March 20th. Now, that was the first day of Av. Okay, that is a very holy day in the Jewish calendar, because that's the first day of the Jewish calendar. Now, Passover this year, we had another blood moon. On Rosh Hashanah, which takes place, guys, in eight days from now, we have a partial solar eclipse. Now, these are all signs in the, in the sky. This is what we're called to look at. Now, here's the one. This is Mark Biltz's last one. I want you to hear. On the 28th of this month, at 6, I'm sorry, at 547, at 547, over the city of Jerusalem, you go outside and you look over the city and you're going to have a, a super blood moon. The moon is now at perigee. Perigee is when the moon is closest to the earth. And at that time, it will be the closest, the first time that we've had a super blood moon on that date ever. Okay? And it's going to take place. And we'll see it in America. When the moon sets, or when the moon rises, we'll see it here. Okay? On September the 27th. It'll be the September the 28th when they'll see it over Jerusalem. Now, I want to keep this in mind. These are the events of the seventh Shemitah. This is the last. This is the last year of the Shemitah, guys. When all this is taking place, every seventh Shemitah, seven times seven, forty-nine years, is followed by a jubilee, a year of celebration. This Shemitah of, is a Shemitah that had the Tetrad blood moons. It's not happened before. All this occurring on the Jewish feast days, which has not happened, Jonathan, in two thousand years. Two thousand years. Now we've had Tetrads, but never ever happening on a Shemitah like this. What do you think? God's got my attention, you know, but what, (laughs) what, what is, what do we do? You know, like, uh, like I'm all ears, you know, but I guess we just, okay. I'm going to tell you guys, I got, 
in front of me, I'm looking at the Jewish calendar, all right? So in the Jewish calendar, you have feast days in the springtime. You have Passover, okay? You have, the, uh, you have Pentecost. You have unleavened bread. All of these that I'm talking about were the fulfillment of Christ's first coming. Christ, for, Jesus was crucified on Passover, okay? He was the, the, the sacrificial lamb. Okay, 50 days later, okay, on a, on a jubilee, Jesus on Pentecost was, was seen. He, he was seen by all of, his, uh, all of the people. The Holy Spirit was poured out. The church was formed. That's the date. When they call you a Pentecostal, that was the date that the Holy Spirit was poured out upon mankind. And that happened on Pentecost. Now, the last three feasts take place this month. Okay, Tabernacles on the 13th, the Day of Atonement on the 23rd, the trumpets take place. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going backwards. I'm looking at the camera. Trumpets take place on the 13th, Atonement takes place on the 23rd, and Tabernacles when the last blood moon. Now, what does all this might mean? Because I'm going to summarize it right now. We are in the Shemitah year 577. Okay, this is the Jewish year, 2014-15. We're starting a jubilee. This is the jubilee of 5,000, the Jewish year, 5,576, 2015-16. The blood moons have just taken place. Do, and there's the question, Jonathan, and I can't answer this. And, I, and I, I won't say anything that I don't know, but I will tell you, the numbers add up. Yeah. <laughs> does the, does the seven-year Great Tribulation begin in two weeks? My gut feeling is, yes, the numbers all add up. It all adds up. The, Daniel's numbers, the, four, the 490 years that the Jews... Now, here's the key. Jesus, in Matthew 23, right before he was crucified, he was standing in front of the, the, the politicians of his day. He had the Sadducees and the, and, the, and the Pharisees, the scoffers, and he said, woe unto you. He gave them the seven woes. And then he finished by saying this, Jonathan, this is it. You will not see me again until you cry out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch Atah Vashem Adonai. That is the key to Jesus' return. Israel today is an ungodly state. Yes, Benjamin Netanyahu came over here and he warned the world. He is a man of God's choosing. They have to repent, all of them, and accept Jesus as their Messiah. They're going to go through the next seven years. Now, whether we get raptured at the beginning, middle, or end, I got friends and all, and I'm not telling you guys, I'm not, I never take sides on that one, okay? Uh, it would be nice to leave. I've asked God for me to stay. I'm 100% Jewish. I want to stay the entire seven years. I want to lead my people to Yeshua. That, that's my goal. Now, it's up to God to allow me to do that. But I truly believe, okay, that this year of Jubilee, we're going to have that war. We're going to have that peace treaty. The temple's going to be built. The Antichrist is coming on the scene. We're going to have a new currency. Guys, listen to me. If they have a new currency, it's not going to be paper money anymore, Jonathan. It's going to be digital because mm -hmm. everything is digital. And it's going to be controlled like everything's controlled. And see, guys, right now... There's people out there in America getting paid under the table. They're not paying taxes. There's crime going on. Man, once they go to this digital, that ends all that. Okay, all the money comes in, right? Mm. Okay, so it's coming. Now, the thing is this. If you take that little chip, which is coming, and by the way, it's on my website. Over in Europe, they have people chipped already. This is true. I mean, it's on my website. Uh, countdown to Daniel's 70th week. I'll post it again. Uh but I want you to hear this. If you take it, you can't shop at Walmart. You're not going to get a paycheck. You can't pay your rent, and you can't, you can't, you're locked out of everything because that's the system that's coming up. Now, how many people are going to be willing to do that? But it tells you in the Bible, if you live in the sevens, if you live in the kingdom where we're supposed to live, as Israel, God will bless us. Do you hear that, people? It's trusting God. Are you going to not trust God and take the beast? the mark of the beast, and live in the sixes in the world, or are you going to trust God? Because, again, that's the option, Jonathan, it's coming our way. It's coming. Now, I don't know the day or hour when that's coming, but it's coming, 
And I don't know the day or hour that Jesus is going to return, but it's coming and it's right in front of us, guys. And so now is the time to spread this word because it's it's going out, but not in the churches. They're afraid to touch this one. OK, Jonathan, you're a brave man to put me on again. <laughs> I love, love having you, Neil. Now, one one thing I do want to ask is this is this is God getting our attention so that we can try to fight this or should, you know, or or is okay. he in control of everything? You know, we yeah. should not do anything. Yeah, guys, look, I'm going to tell you something. Things happen in our lives every day, okay? Every day. And so what does God say? He says, trust me with all your heart. And lean not upon your understanding. In everything you do, acknowledge me, and I'll take care of you. That's what it says. Now, yes, there will be persecution, guys, because, again, we hear what's going on in the news. We're all aware of that. Right now, on the end of my PowerPoint, I have, whose side are you on? I've got the six on the left. I've got the seven on the right, Jonathan. And Jonathan, i got a picture right in the middle. The picture is a woman that's five foot four. It's a mugshot of Kim Davis, the cl uh, court clerk. The court clerk. Now, she could have quit her job. She could have quit and caved. She didn't. I can't speak for her. I don't know what I would have done in that situation, okay? But I think I probably would have done the same thing. And she's in jail right now at this moment because, guys, the covenant of the marriage is not my idea. It's not Jonathan's idea. It's God's idea. It's a covenant. Till death do you part when a man marries a woman. Nothing else. That's a covenant. That, that's God's idea. Government cannot pick or choose. See, the thing is this. I work in a public school. I've got to watch all the time everything that happens because I was put out of school, Jonathan, uh, in April of 2008 because I wrote Newton's Riddle. Because somebody out there saw my picture in the paper holding this book and said Christians should not be teaching astronomy. And they put me out of school and they accused me of proselytizing, which is preaching Jesus. In the class. So here's what they did. For one month, I had to deliver toilet paper. I was on a toilet paper truck. We delivered. I was not allowed at Annapolis High. I was not allowed in evening high school. And for that month, I learned this verse, okay? Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Jonathan, I learned that. It's Isaiah 40, 31. I live by that. I trust God. Now, after interviewing all my kids and having these kids you know, being asked, does your teacher, Mr. Russell, preach Jesus? And then they said, what? I teach astronomy. All right. I was, I, was, I was left back in the school. I was persecuted, Jonathan. I was persecuted for something I didn't do. But I did it because my wife, Cindy, told me at the time that I acted out of, again, self-interest. I called the Capitol, the, the newspaper. I had them come over and do the story in the book. Okay? Uh. It was pride. I repented of that, and I got rid of that one real fast, okay? Now, Jonathan, again, we're only human beings, and we are frail, and the devil knows us. But, guys, here's the thing. Put God first. Trust God with all your heart, strength, and might. Lean not upon your own understanding. Everything you do, guys, like I said, acknowledge him. The world, the world is out there. It tells you in the Bible that we are we are in the world, but we're not of the world. I'm not telling you guys to be Amish <laughs> and, and uh, drive around in a little uh, horse-driven cart. No. God blesses us. It says that we're to trust him. That's all. Put him first. Love him. Talk to him. Have a relationship with him. And love people. All the people, your relatives, the people you work with, help them. You know, you have to preach Jesus to them. Show them Jesus. Show them that you love them. Now, when these things happen and they come to you because they know that you represent Jesus, then you're going to talk to them. Then you're going to show the love of God because they trust you. See, they trust. They, you can't trust the world. You can't trust the Republicans. Why do you think everybody wants Donald Trump? Because they can't stand the Republicans. That's, they want Trump because he's out there saying things that nobody else is saying. Right. Why do they want Ben Carson? Because he's not a politician, because he's saying things that are the truth. They're sick and tired of politics. Politics is six. They want seven, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it seems like you know fertile ground for spreading the truth, I guess, right? Absolutely, Jonathan. So anyhow, uh, this has been fun tonight. And uh, again, uh, guys, what I told you, all I did was connect the dots, went all the way back to Moses, went all the way back, all the way forward to uh, right now, today, two weeks from now. 
Uh, and again, <laughs> all, all, not, I did, all I did was just blow your mind with some knowledge that no one else has ever heard. You know, no, no, no big deal. <laughs> guys, look, what's going to happen is going to happen. Guys in control. Neil Russell or Jonathan Rapp, you know, we're just here and we're, we're being obedient to the Lord to put this stuff out. We're not here to scare anybody. We're here to tell you that this is a blink down here. It tells you what is your life. It's a vapor, okay? Here today and gone tomorrow. Now, God will bless you. I am blessed, Jonathan. I am blessed. I mean, we're blessed. We, we live in America. I mean, we, do, we should count our blessings every day. You know, when things happen, when I was operated on, I didn't dwell on my pain. I dwelled on the fact that I had a doctor who took out my prostate through my belly button. And I told him the other day he should quit his job as a, a urologist because he gave me the prettiest belly button on planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> my wife just went, ah. <laughs> Okay? And, and again, I don't have cancer. I'm healed by Jesus' stripes. Honest to goodness. You know, I was telling Jonathan, I'm not sure if I shared this with you. I used to wear glasses. Sid Roth put his hands on my eyes one day and he prayed over me. And here's why. When I was a dumb kid, I stared at the sun with my left eye for three minutes. I burned a hole in my retina. So mm. I told Sid this. And he took, he prayed over me, took his hands off my eyes. And he said, well, is it there? You know, the hole in my retina, mm. the sun spot. And I look, dang gone, it was still there. But guess what? I have 20-20 vision from that moment forward. See, God ha God never does what we think he's going to do. <laughs> he has a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's what I'm most looking forward to. It's like with this all this you know stuff unfolding, like you just said, God's got a sense of humor, and it's never what you expect. So no, no. I'm, I'm all attention here. I'm just really looking forward to see how it unfolds. Yeah, me too, Jonathan. I'm here on the other side. Well, I'm, I'm with you, guys. Look, Jonathan Kahn can't tell you how it's going to unfold, okay? He can just give you the numbers that I just gave you. Mm. Mark Biltz can't tell you how it's going to unfold. He can just tell you that he found these tetrad moons that happened on the Jewish holidays during the last, the last seventh year of this uh, current Shemitah, which starts the Jubilee year. Okay, nobody's going to tell you because we're God's in control. Now, God admonishes us to look at the signs of the time, but nobody knows that day or hour when Jesus is going to come back to planet Earth. Nobody knows the day when we're going to get raptured. We don't know that. And that's that's what Jesus said. The angels don't even know that. But we do know that there's seven years, okay? So again, one more time, here's a review for all of you. Remember, seven is the key to unlock it. Seven is God's perfect number. He unlocks all that. So in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, you have the 62 sevens. And you have the seven sevens. Now, the 62 sevens, the first ones brought us to Jesus' first coming. The seven sevens, as Newton said, okay, when Jerusalem is back in the hands of Israel after 2,000 years, there's going to be 47, 49 years of seven sevens, which will bring us to this coming, um, tw the 23rd of September. I told you that the walls were rebuilt by the order of first, okay, King Erdogan in 444 BC, and Jesus came back. The second one was when Suleiman told rebuild the walls because they were destroyed, and that happened in 1539. I'm pulling all this out of my head, and I'm dead tired. That's really cool. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> and if you add the numbers that we did, it takes you again to the same day as Newton, guys. Listen to this, what we're telling you. Jonathan Kahn's Shemitah ends, okay? This last one ends on, on a little 29, which is eight days from now. And then we have a jubilee year, okay? And it's it's going to happen. These are all all these things. The blood moves. All this stuff I told you is happening. It's the great September 2015 convergence, and it's happening. And we're here for such a time as this, Jonathan. Thank you for thank you for coming on, Neil. Thanks for sharing that with us and and keeping us all you know in line with what's going on and attentive. Anybody out there who doesn't know Jesus, can you tell them how to uh, how to do that? Oh, okay, here you go. Now, if you're living in the sixes, let's move over to the sevens. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Now, again, remember what God said. If you, it, He told the Israelites, He said, "Look, you obey my laws, you obey my covenants, you you plant for six years, let it rest. Trust God with all your heart, guys. Put God first in all your thoughts." Repent of your sins. We're all sinners. We all sin. I sin every day. My wife and I hold hands. We go before the cross. 
Uh, we do things, we don't do things that we should do. We do things that we shouldn't do, we don't do things that we should do. That's sin. It's going against God. And so, you know, again, we all screw up. I'm a screw up. Okay, I, I repent every day. So the blood of Christ makes us righteous. That's all. The day of atonement was the blood of the lamb was spread on the altar on the mercy seat. That's what they did. When Jesus died, his blood was spread on the mercy seat for everybody, for once and for all. That's Christianity. So once you repent, you go before God every day and just cleanse yourself like you get a bath, comb your hair, put on your nice clothes, and repent every day. Yes, we're, we're saved. But, you know, we screw up, and the devil's out there, and he wants us to screw up. He knows your weaknesses. He knows my weaknesses. So that's why I cleanse. But, again, repent of your sins. Put God first. Talk to God. Have a relationship with God. Don't break his commandments. Keep his ordinances, okay, and love people. Don't judge people. Don't hold offense. This is what we're called to do as Christians, okay? That's it. It's an easy thing. We can keep our jobs. We can keep our cars. We don't have to go around with a buggy, okay? We don't have to sacrifice anything other than the fact that we sacrifice ourselves because it tells you, Jonathan, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you, brethren, make yourself a living sacrifice, okay, unto the Lord, pure and holy. See, is another thing, Jonathan. Everybody says, well, God's a God of love. Of course he is. He sent Jesus, but God's holy. And God cannot be in the presence of sin. The only way we can present ourselves is through the blood of Christ. Just like the high priest would go into the temple before it was destroyed and present the blood of an animal in atonement for the sins. Jesus did it once for all. We don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. So Jesus did it for us. So guys, look at the, that's the love. That's the love. But God can't be around unholy things. And if we are sinners and we don't repent okay, before, and take the blood of Jesus, we don't go to heaven. Just like that woman who read her Bible every single day and listened to my music, my Christian music, who would not forgive her, her daughter-in-law. And if she died in unforgiveness, it tells you that. If you cannot forgive, then your Father in heaven will not forgive you. So, Jonathan, I think that's the gospel truth. <laughs> I do too, Neil. And I'm going to pray a prayer over you. Father... I thank you for Jonathan Rapp's obedience. Magnify his program. Father, let this word that was spoken today reach the world. It tells you, as Jesus said, that the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached throughout the world, and the end will come. Thank you, Father. Bless him in every which way. Bless his family. Bless him in financial, his health, and everything. Because he is an obedient servant unto you, Father. And uh, it's nice been rapping with you, Rapp. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Neil, I'll let so you let's go. let's wrap it up. <laughs> All right. Um, is there anywhere I can send people? You know, people go to check out. Um, I know you got your website, countdown to daniel70thweek.com. Um, yeah. Anything right. else? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, buddy. Hey, people, how would you like to not to be sick ever, ever, ever? All right. So I got the best health website out there, and that's just not my opinion. So, Jonathan, when Jesus prayed over people, he put his hands and he said, be made whole. Dot net. <laughs> right, right. And be made whole dot net is the best. It's it, it covers everything. OK, it took me a year to make that one. I, I go cuckoo when I make stuff, but it, it covers everything and everything's there. I'm doing uh, I, I divided into 18 little segments on there. OK, they're all videos. And the factor number uh, two is the pH factor. I, I only eat high pH food. I have no inflammation. I'm 63. I, I was so sick last year. I eliminated, as you know, coffee, but I also eliminated milk products because milk products have two chemicals in it that cause inflammation, okay? Mm. So lactose is one, and that causes – I used to drink a lot of milk, and I'm done with that, okay? So, again, that's one. Guys, if you want to know how God created the universe and everything in six 24-hour days and 15 billion years using Einstein's theory of relativity – Go to my number one website also that's out there. It's genesisbigbang.com, and it will explain. I made it for an MIT physics professor, Dr. Gerald Schroeder, who lives in Jerusalem. Um, also, Cindy's story. Cindy was my first wife. Before she died, she said, Neil, when I get my miracle, you're going to make me a website to give people hope. So, guys, 
She had a miracle. It's all on there. We were on television worldwide. It's called curedoflivercancer.com. And all the promises for healing in the Bible are all there. Okay? Now, last. Let me see. I'm taking a roll. I, I, got, I know I've got a bunch of websites. Uh, I got a, I want, Jonathan, i got one coming up, and uh, you've got a gift. Uh, guys, uh, a guy named Ray Lewis played in the 2013 Super Bowl, and in the Super Bowl he wore a jersey that said Psalm 91 on it. And everybody's asking, well, what in the world is Psalm 91? So within the next two to three weeks, Jonathan, I'll send this to you. I'm starting a new website. We're starting a business, Psalm91Wear.com. And it is going to be, go it will sell off the hook. Okay, so Jonathan, you get a free hat and a shirt so you can wear it. Nice, right? yeah, that sounds That's, awesome, Neil. Well, you'll, yeah, you're going to love that. So guys, again, see, we all have gifts. My gift is not math. My gift is talking and thinking out of the box. So take your gifts and use them to God's glory. And see what he's done with this Jew who couldn't read in school and couldn't do math in school. I mean, here I'm an author. I tell the kids all the time. Here, I mean, I write music. Here, I've been on television. Here, I, I mean, just unbelievable. And so, guys, this is what you do for the Lord. You might say, well, I don't know what I can do for the Lord. Well, you know what? Here's what you're going to do. Get a relationship with him. Talk to him. Love him with all your heart. And God will open up those doors. The parable of the town is that one was given five, another one was given three, another one gives him one. The one with five used him. He got five more. The one that was given three used him. got three more. What are the talents? The talents are not just your talents. It's the people in your lives and what you vest into them, okay? So, again, Jonathan, what an honor. Right back at you. Well, I, again, I want to say, if, if we're still around on the earth, I'd like to have you back on again to talk about that BeMadeWhole.net and all the other stuff you got. Yeah, well, Jonathan, <laughs> uh, do your homework. This is your teacher, Neil, talking, all right? Okay. You go to BeMadeWhole.net. You go to CureLiverCancer.com. You go to GenesisBigBang.com. Uh, oh, there's another one, GenesisBigBang.com. Yeah, now that'll explain to you guys, if you have no idea how God did it, okay, in six 24-hour days and 15 billion years using Einstein, you will understand, okay? Let's go to that. It's a not, I didn't come up with this, Dr. Gerald Schroeder, MIT physics professor, who wrote Genesis and the Big Bang. I, I made it for him. And he also wrote The Science of God. And, uh, and Schroeder's a good name. you got a friend named Schroeder, don't you? Right, right. He's usually on the other guy on the show, but he, he had to... Uh, Oh, Stephen, listen to me. Uh, I, 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 I'm I so blessed using your name in my book. Everybody likes the name Schroeder, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. And, we're, you know, we missed Stephen tonight. I don't know what happened, but everything's okay. I think he just couldn't get a, get a connection. But, Neil, I will let you go. I know that we could keep going for hours. I don't want to take you any longer. I appreciate your time. I love you, and God bless you and your family. And ditto for you, too, okay, brother? So, gay schlafen, which means go to sleep. <laughs> All right, gay <Gage> sloughing. <laughs> Good night. Good night, Neil. All right.